our interesting talk uh, tonight. And I'm here to represent three organizations which were very active in organizing all this. Uh, that's first the uh, Society for Pluralist Economics Vienna. Uh, the second, uh, I didn't figure out how to pronounce it in English, so I just say Wirtschaftspolitische Akademie. And the third one, Beigewurm, uh, Beirat für Gesellschaft, Wirtschaft und Umwelt, Politische Alternativen. Uh, we did that together in cooperation with the Renner Institute, which will be represented by uh, Sebastian Schublach. And we are happy, very happy to have you here tonight for your talk. And uh, yeah, Sebastian will have a few words to introduce our guest. And yeah, I'm happy that you all came here and are part of that tonight. So please enjoy. Hello, everyone, again, to most of you. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Karl Renner Institute, whether you are here with us in this beautiful breakfast room or you are watching online. Before we start, please give me the opportunity to welcome and introduce our speaker, Özlem Oneran, who just arrived this morning from London. Thanks for coming, and I think you have deserved a big round of applause. <laughs> Özlem Oneran is Professor of Economics at the University of Greenwich and the Director of the Greenwich Political Economy Research Centre. She has done extensive research on issues of inequality, wage-led growth, employment, globalization, gender and crises. She has directed research projects for the International Labour Organization, ILO, for the Vienna Chamber of Labour, for the Austrian Science Foundation, just to name a few. And something I want to point out in particular, she is member of the scientific committee of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, that is a think tank that we as Karl Renner Institute are a member of. Professor Unaran will talk today about some of the manifold challenges, hopefully not all of them, because it, will be, it would be a quite long talk, uh, and inequalities that we are facing today in Europe. She will talk about the integration crisis, the rise of right-wing populist parties and movements, and possible links to economic policies, but you will also talk about Brexit and its consequences for people working in the UK. But we want to end this day with a positive mood, with a forward-looking mood. And we don't only want to focus on problems and challenges, but we want to shed light on progressive alternatives, on the opportunities that lie within the European project and also within the progressive movements in Europe. I'm really looking forward to your speech. Again, welcome to Vienna. Islam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's always great to come back to uh, Vienna, where I uh, worked and lived for uh, about six years. Uh, and it's uh, so nice to be back together with uh, colleagues from Beigewum, Renner Institute, uh, and Chamber of Labor, uh, the university, and uh, also so many new young uh, faces and uh, new friends here. Um, uh, what, before I start uh, my talk, I just want to emphasize that this is uh, part of uh, something new we started doing at Greenwich. We started a new series that we call Economics for Campaigners. It's basically a broad economics education for people who do not have any background in economics, uh, but who want to act and change things. So uh, we are doing it for free uh, for, for citizens, and all we want in return is that they campaign for changing things. Uh, when I started to study economics, one of the ideas that I had was it's not just about understanding the world, but also changing the world. And luckily, uh, despite all the uh, problems that we are having in Britain, in Europe, and around the world, there is a lot of optimism and uh, activism uh, going around in our communities and organizations for change. So I'll, I 
really want to uh, spend uh, a lot of uh, time around that. And one thing I also want to add that um, uh, although Brexit is, of course, one of the uh, darkest moments, I think, in the process of European integration, your process of European integration, uh, something else is happening in Britain, uh, which is also new to uh, most activists in Britain, uh, with Jeremy Corbyn becoming the leader of the Labour Party. And we did a lot of researchers like myself, uh, trade unionists, uh, have been a lot more involved in uh, policy making as well. So I'm working uh, for a team of economists uh, that provide some advice to Labour Party policies. Uh, I'll try to touch to them as well today. Uh, and of course, uh, there's always more that can be done. So I'll also uh, be critical about the limits of the current uh, Labour Party policy stance. And hopefully, I will talk uh, about what that means for an alternative Europe as well. Uh, before I start today's talk, though, uh, sorry for a small commercial break, but whatever I do today is also what we teach at Greenwich. And in the morning, I had a gig uh, at the VU with uh, a few students uh, about our new master's in economics program. And since our chair is representing the Plurale Economic uh, Network in Austria, of course, uh, we are very proud of the pluralism dimension of our new program, which is running through from every course, from core to option, bringing in a multitude of theories from uh, neoclassical economics to new Keynesian, post Keynesian, feminist, and ecological, and Marxist, and institutional economics. So if there is a lifetime er er learner or uh, a young person who is just contemplating masters, please uh, talk to me afterwards. I have some leaflets here. OK, so um, of course, uh, the flows of the economic policies in the EU is very uh, well known uh, to most of us, but I'll still emphasize a few of them, because anything we do, uh, if we want to uh, maintain and transform Europe, we need to understand that. Um, although, of course, uh, Britain was not part of the uh, Eurozone, the policy stance uh, of the European Union economic policy uh, framework, I think, laid the foundations of people's discontent uh, about, uh, about where they are, their feeling of being uh, left behind. And uh, Brexit can be tied uh, partly to that. It's not all bleak, so I'll, as I said, I will talk about progressive alternatives and in particular about Labour parties for the many, not the few, manifesto, which really flew off the shelves uh, last June during the general elections. Uh, uh, but it's not ending there. Uh, there is a lot more that needs to be done uh, for progressive policies. And hopefully, I will end by what that all means for another Europe, because uh, if and when Brexit happens, uh, there will be a, a lot of progressives in uh, Britain who are very eager to continue to work with European progressives. And one of my ideas is uh, when the current young people become reach their 40s, they will be the campaigning group to uh, rejoin uh, the new European Union, a, a, a transformed and more progressive European Union, uh, bring Britain back uh, in. So we will continue to campaign for that too. Okay, in a nutshell, uh, the uh, European Economic and uh, Monetary Union can be, I think, very simply described as a neoliberal uh, project. One of the core problems here is the emphasis in having a monetary union without a fiscal union, without a uh, European Union fiscal policy, and without a political uh, union. If anything, in terms of fiscal policy stance, coordination in Europe, that's the coordination of a straitjacket in terms of fiscal policy. Stability and Growth Pact was the foundation of that. And of course, uh, anything that is coordinated is just putting limits on national budget deficits without any further EMU fiscal policy to address real convergence and cohesion uh, across regions of the European Union. Now, um, the monetary union has uh, its own further uh, flows. So one flow is that it doesn't have fiscal and political union. But as monetary policy, the whole idea of independence of the European Central Bank uh, of the Eurozone is nothing but having a currency, the euro, 
without a state behind it, without a political union behind it. And of course, the other uh, backbone of the uh, EMU policy framework is liberalization and competition. Um, so this is a founding feature of the uh, single market of the European Union. And of course, it comes with very serious limits on industrial policy, and in particular, state aid policies. And I'll refer to that later because this is one of the concerns of progressives in Britain who are uh, a bit wary about the pro stopping the process of uh, Brexit. They have concerns about the limits on state aid, aid from a progressive point of view. Of course, liberalization and competition uh, meant, uh, in terms of the financial uh, market, financial deregulation. And uh, all financial deregulation brought was actually uh, to create a fertile ground for very risky trade imbalances across the Eurozone. It didn't lead to an efficient allocation of financial resources credit across uh, the different regions in Europe. Quite on the contrary, it fed bubbles, housing bubbles, financial bubbles. It uh, made the continuity of a fragile uh, high uh, indebtedness of in particular households um, in, if you like, the periphery of Europe. Uh, and it made uh, current account or international trade imbalances in the periphery of Europe uh, sustainable uh, in a delusionary way, really. Um, and of course, the Treaty of uh, Lisbon just wrote all that in the treaty. Now, um, uh, in a way, it's correct to say uh, European neoliberalism or EMU is using this treaty that there are European regulations to incapacitate the nation states. And this is where sometimes even the progressives start thinking, okay, European neoliberalism is a straight jacket, get me out of there. I do not agree with this point, and this was not my campaigning position uh, when we were campaigning for remain for change during the referendum in Britain, uh, but it's, um, it's easy to see how people are falling into this resentment about uh, the flows in the EMU framework. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of my work has been about this neoliberal project's uh, implications in terms of rising inequality uh, and implications for working people. Um, and I think this, is, this has been very important uh, in creating the resentment about Europe among uh, the uh, mass uh, working uh, people. So uh, in the absence of any re uh, real convergence policies as part of the European uh, economic policy design, or any adjustment in terms of imbalances, in terms of trade balances, let's say, across Europe, falls on the labor market. Labor market flexibility is supposed to sort out imbalances. So there is a lot of emphasis on wage flexibility. And of course, uh, after the crisis, matters got worse. Uh, all the expectation from uh, the periphery countries, uh, Greece, Portugal, uh, Spain, in terms of adjustment, was uh, that they had to decrease their wages to make their economies uh, more competitive, which is something uh, which we call internal devaluation. Since they cannot devalue because there is single uh, currency, there is the euro. Uh, so if you don't want to leave the euro, you have to make yourself competitive. So that means labor market and wages have to be downward uh, flexible. Now, uh, this has always been the emphasis of the European Commission, not just after the crisis, but also before the crisis. And therefore, it of course, introduces a certain deflationary uh, bias and it puts the burden of adjustment only on the peripheral countries that are having trade, international trade or current account uh, deficits. Uh, there is no European social policy worthy of the name uh, in terms of addressing those imbalances across um, regions. There's also not really a systematic European industrial policy to address the asymmetries in terms of productive structures where countries are located in the hierarchy of the global value chains. Uh, and of course, uh, 
there is never been uh, any uh, European Commission incentive to coordinate wage policies along with social policies um, as part of a social Europe model uh, in, in the European uh, establishment. Um, certainly when they talked about convergence, there was no indicator that would address a convergence in terms of the living standards and welfare. Not even the simplest GDP, gross domestic product or national income per capita uh, was uh, a criteria that was being uh, paid attention, let alone uh, broader social indicators that we could imagine having, such as the uh, rate of unemployment or the quality of jobs or human development indicators. None of that were included in the convergence criteria of the European uh, policy framework. So there was a lot of emphasis on what we would call nominal convergence, convergence in inflation rights, convergence in interest rights, rather than real, if you like, genuine convergence. And of course, this uh, whole policy package uh, has gone with a very systematic attack on labor, uh, which I uh, describe here as uh, systematic rise in inequality in terms of the share of labor income and national income uh, falling. So here is what I talk about in terms of rising inequality. This is um, EU 15, 15 old member states of the European Union, data from 1960s to uh, the, uh, 2015, and the blue line is the share of wage income in the pie of national income as a whole. Uh, if you see that it's peaking uh, somewhere in the 70s, then you see that there is a uh, secular decline year after year, particularly becoming remarkable uh, with the 80s. If you think that might have been, um, you know, uh, by design and a good thing, um, uh, well, you would be exactly thinking what European uh, Commission uh, has been saying. So you would be forgiven for uh, thinking this because European Commission, report after report, has exactly advocated this fall in the wage share. This is what they call this wage moderation. Lisbon Treaty uh, and report after report, it came from the European Commission, did advocate that wages per person, real wages, have to increase slower than the productivity of labor, productivity output per hour of work. So if our wage is increasing slower than what we contribute to production, that means our share in the total pie of <coughs> output will be shrinking as wage earners. And the European Commission has written it into directives. And the, re the reason why they advocated was that this is the thing that will make Europe the most competitive region in the world. Thanks to that, we would be having uh, huge trade surpluses with the rest of the world, with the US, with China, and thereby a lot of jobs will be created and benefits will eventually trickle down. And investment, private investment would be buoyant because the mirror image of falling wage share is rising profit share. Well, this was the story. This is the European uh, economic policy stance when it comes to wage and labor market and income distribution policies. Did it work? Here is the red line. Hmm. The red line is very simple. The growth of national product, gross domestic product, uh, annual. And if you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or you don't have to do econometrics as we were discussing today uh, in the morning. I do a lot of that for you, uh, but it is enough to look at this graph and be a little bit puzzled why the European Commission insists in this policy stance because growth, the increase in national activity, along with a falling wage share, rising inequality, rising profitability, has been much more uh, moderate, and it has been also more volatile. Of course, not to mention the Great Recession in 2008 uh, and 2009 there. Okay, so this is just uh, one graph, maybe it doesn't tell too much, you could say, but we did a lot of research on that for the International Labour uh, Office uh, that my colleague had uh, mentioned at the beginning, and Financial Times said, uh, made a story uh, about it uh, in 2012, and here is the title that they gave, citing our work here. Uh, Capital gobbles labor's share, but victory is empty. 
profitability, profit share is increasing, labor share is being gobbled by capital, but this isn't leading to better economic performance. It is not leading to more stable economic performance. So there's something wrong here. Um, uh, before we start moving on what can be done, I think it is important to understand what is the missing uh, element in European Commission's neoliberal macroeconomic policy stance. It is uh, backed by mainstream, if I may simplify, neoclassical economic theory that looks only at the supply side of the economy, that's only one side of the economy, that sees our wages as a cost. So the expectation is if you cut wages, if you moderate wage growth, that will lead to positive effect on investment, private investment. It will also trigger exports. But this doesn't address the puzzle we have just seen in the simple graph I showed you. Then why is growth still lower despite a rise in profit share in the post-80s? Uh, well, um, we work with uh, what we call a structuralist uh, macroeconomic uh, framework that does take on board the demand side on the economy as well as the supply side of the economy. Um, if you want to label it, you can call it post-Keynesian. If you want to be even more specific, uh, it drives a lot on the work of uh, Mihail Kaletsky. Well, we say wages are not just a cost item. They have a dual role. So they are, of course, a cost item, but they are also a very important source of domestic demand. In that sense, we make a claim to have a general theory because we are not one-sided. We are not just saying wages are a cost. They are also a source of demand. So if you lower wages, three things happen in Europe well, or elsewhere. It does lead to lower consumption demand by the households because simply you could say it, uh, like this, the poor consume more out of their income, proportionate to their income, compared to the rich. And uh, if you extend that simple idea to workers versus profit earners, capitalists, workers consume a higher proportion of their wages than uh, the employers or the capitalists consume out of their profit income. So if you cut wages, consumption decreases. And I can bet on that because I have done research on this for about 30 countries in the world, uh, not just in Europe. Uh, you could be forgiven for thinking that lower wages means higher profitability, so that may intrigue business enterprise investment. But I will um, ask you to be cautious here. Uh, businesses aren't stupid. Investment is not just about profitability, but it's also about the sales prospects. Can I sell what I'm producing? If households consumption is being cut because of a wage cut, businesses will be a bit puzzled here and a bit discouraged. So there are two opposite effects going uh, on there. And the third effect is one of the most important backbones of the Lisbon Treaty or European Commission position. Of course, lower wages means higher competitiveness. It will lead to higher exports, lower imports. Well, however, again, be careful. That will depend on many things. It will depend on how sensitive your exports are to prices and how much price competitiveness you get when you decrease your uh, unit labor costs or the wage share, if you like. They are almost twin sisters. And if I think of Austria or countries like Germany selling very high tech export products, these things aren't very sensitive to prices and they are very capital intensive. So a cut in wages aren't necessarily giving you a uh, boost in terms of demand coming from net exports. It's a boost, but a small one. If investment is also a bit puzzled between lower consumption demand, but higher profitability, then you may be left with a very large cut in domestic consumption. Anyway, I did say our framework is general, so we do not outrule the fact that the total effect can be positive, but we say it may also be negative. So lower wage share may lead to then lower growth uh, and fewer jobs, lower, lower employment. This is the economy that we call a wage-led economy. If the total effect is positive, that means lower wage share would lead to higher growth. That economy is what we call profit-led economy. Well, if you like, the mainstream or European Commission, European uh, economic policy framework assumes that Europe as a whole each individual European country, and even the world as a whole, is a profit-led economy. Well, uh, is it the case? 
As I said, we have done a lot of research on that, first for the International Labour Office, more recently for the Foundation of European Progressive uh, Studies, uh, with which Renner Institute also does a lot of research. What we find is a very simple fact. First of all, domestic economy, if you look at just household consumption plus private investment, is not profit-led. It is wage-led. If you're cutting wages in Europe, in Austria, in Germany, and in all of Europe, because we're all doing the same, that leads to a decline in our domestic demand. Now, um, if you are looking at what's happening in terms of uh, adding on top of that uh, net export effect, of course, how important are net exports for your economy is important. If you look at the large European economies, Germany, France, Italy, um, Exports aren't that important for them as a part of their total demand. They are actually, even when you take on board the net export or international demand, they're wage-led. There's some other small European economies, uh, Netherlands, um, Sweden. Uh, interestingly, they're also wage-led. Uh, for Austria, I hear results that say Austria is wage-led too. But you could be forgiven for having some concerns there. The more important thing is what happens when everyone in Europe do it, does the same. Uh, we are all cutting wages because we are all implementing wage moderation. This is written into our policy framework. We are coordinating that, in my opinion, wrong policy very successfully. Here is the positive thing. That means we can reverse and coordinate also some alternative policies. But the wage share has been falling in all of the European Union member states simultaneously. That includes not just EU15, but also Eastern European new member states. What happens when we all do that? Our international competitiveness position vis-a-vis -vis each other within Europe doesn't change a whole lot because Austria is cutting the wage share along with Germany, Netherlands and France and Ireland. Uh, we are trading a lot with each other in Europe. Intra-European trade is very high. Actually, European Union's trade with the rest of the world is a lot smaller compared to intra-European trade. So that means when we all do the same, race to the bottom in labor costs, we are not gaining any international competitiveness edge vis-a-vis -vis each other, so we are left with this negative domestic demand effect. Consumption falls, investment gets uh, discouraged with the fall in demand, so hence that explains what's going on in Europe. I have some numbers here, but I'm not going to bore you with that, but the important thing to note is that Europe as a whole is a very large economy, and it's a wage-led demand regime, or to put it negatively, if we, ha if we keep decreasing the wage share, we are not going to grow with that. So Lisbon Treaty has written something very wrong in, in, into stone, if you like. Um, so you could imagine there may be a small uh, country that could have been profitless in isolation in some estimations. Ireland, Belgium shows up like that, Denmark. Uh, but they would grow only if they were the only single European country in the world dumping wages. When they do it together with their trade partners, they're not able to uh, gain anything from that. So there's a very clear limit to this international competitiveness strategy that is based on wage competition, wage moderation, and uh, increasing inequality. This is what we call fallacy of composition. What may work for a single small very open economy stops working when all of us do the same. Yeah. And European Commission is actually, uh, for better or worse, exactly coordinating that. So you could tell me what well, Europe has been growing, albeit at a slower pace. How did that happen? Uh, in our opinion, that did lead to a potential crisis of deficiency in demand in Europe. It would have led to a uh, stagnation of uh, demand and growth. This, of course, was circumvented by two distinct growth models. Uh, if you like, we have wage debt economies in Europe that are doing wage moderation and are stuck with it, and they're trying to find their way out of that by two ways. One is the finance-dominated uh, neoliberal accumulation regime, um, and uh, one, one relies on debt-driven growth. That is the UK, but also Ireland, uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, Greece. And the other is the export-driven growth. So here you would find, obviously, uh, Germany, but also uh, Austria, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway. Uh, and of course, uh, European economies aren't alone here. Um, 
you would also find, say, uh, Japan as a center economy in this group, and in the periphery you would find China and South Korea. Interesting enough, I have to say one remark here about South Korea. South Korea has a new progressive presidency, and their policy stance is to implement uh, equality-led development policies. So I've been to Korea twice within the past six months. So it's actually very exciting, at least somewhere some changes happening. Now, obviously, this uh, debt-led versus export-led growth model in the context of this finance-dominated neoliberal European growth or accumulation regime did lead to property bubbles, did lead to capital flows out of the surplus economies of Germany and Austria in the core towards the periphery of Europe or, or, or towards uh, the UK, feeding the debt-led demand uh, regimes where, in the absence of a healthy uh, wage growth, households were relying on debt to maintain their consumption. And of course, debt, uh, debt was being financed by countries like Austria and uh, Germany who are running uh, export surpluses and lending to these countries. So if you think debt debt growth is fragile, I think most people would agree, household debt increasing in, without much uh, relation to growth and income is a risky thing. Uh, well, you should think export-led growth is equally uh, risky mm -hmm. because uh, you can't have export-led growth without someone else running debt somewhere else in the world. So they are the mirror images each of each other. Uh, German or Austrian export-led model is as fragile as the UK or Greek or Spanish debt-led growth model. Of course, this was very fragile. We learned it in the uh, Great Recession, you could think, but not much has sadly changed in the economic policy stance ever since. So what has been happening in the European economic policy framework since crisis, fiscal compact, banking union, I think are um, just uh, not addressing the flows uh, and the root causes of the European imbalances. Euro has just about survived. Uh, the recession for now. But of course, uh, when Simone was drafting the outline for today's talk, uh, he rightly emphasized the rise in right-wing populist parties, sometimes coming also to power, uh, becoming a serious uh, challenge uh, to the European uh, project. Uh, and of course, um, the European neoliberalism, you could say, uh, was uh, particularly led by uh, the, the British uh, neoliberalism, and that's correct. But uh, similar flows, even when uh, Britain wasn't in the Eurozone, fed discontent about economic policy stance. And of course, uh, people look for scapegoats and migrants European migrants and the European Union were the scapegoats for many people who were suffering from this year after year of feeling of being left behind and uh, losing out in terms of uh, their income. So I'll move on to Brexit uh, before I say uh, more about uh, progressive policies. Now, um, it is very clearly established that rising inequality was a strong concern for people who voted for Brexit. Uh, but of course, and I understand these grievances, uh, but if you want to really address the pro problem of inequality, uh, a real solution requires tackling the real causes of the problem. And sadly, um, the whole of the debate around inequality is centered around one dimension of globalization, that is immigration. Um, and we have been doing, uh, some research around that. I'm a migrant. Uh, of course, uh, I uh, became even more conscious of being a migrant and felt, uh, started to feel the need to speak up about that because uh, although I understand people's grievances, inequality did not increase because of migration. That's coming out very clear from research. Um, why did inequality increase? Actually, it increased because of different forms of increase in the area of maneuver spice of capital. It increased because of capital mobility, if you like, in the form of, very importantly, offshoring. So the rise in global value chains and in particular intermediate inputs. It did increase because of outward capital flow, uh, outward foreign direct investment, 
factories outright relocating abroad. And it did increase because of financialization. This is both domestic and international financialization, um, which we can summarize as the rise in the power of finance and financial motifs determining the behavior of also the real economy and uh, non-financial businesses. At the same time, inequality increased because of uh, declining alternatives or fallback options of labor, which is, of course, related to human-made institutional changes, particularly in terms of the decline in the uh, collective bargaining power of uh, unions, decline in the union density as well as the coverage of collective bargaining. It has a lot to do with the deregulation in the labor market, the rise in zero hours contracts, which is a big thing in Britain, and the rise in dodgy self-employment contracts. And of course, also austerity, the cuts in public spending, in education, in health, in public housing, did decrease what we call our fallback options, our social wage as working people. And financialization came also in the form of financialization of the household, the rise in household debt, housing crisis, in the absence of decent affordable houses. All these, of course, tames the bargaining power of workers vis-a-vis -vis capital. So no wonder inequality is increasing. And this is not a new phenomenon, uh, but it has gained a lot of momentum since the 80s. Now, however, if you look at all these things I've been talking about, migrants are the most visible uh, around all these things I have listed. Um, people see the migrants. We are here. I'm here. Um, they don't see what I call offshoring intermediate imports. They don't see the firm relocating elsewhere, which has caused job losses. They think, here is the migrant. That migrant must have taken my job or is now in the queue in front of me when I'm queuing for uh, uh, the hospital. Or my child is in this crowded school because she's sending her children there. And I don't get housing, social housing, because there are all these migrants. Well, actually, of course, all these are true. People are having real problems about access to social housing, access to health? Well, because the government is cutting spending in public uh, uh, services. The government is uh, privatizing housing. Actually, private landlords are renting the former social housing to migrants. So real causes are elsewhere, but people aren't seeing it. OK, so to, to summarize, the real problem is not labor mobility, but un uncontrolled capital mobility. And the asymmetry between the two, the mobility of labor versus capital. Problem is really exploitative employers. And if anything, migrants were not part of a union, unorganized. Uh, but similarly, the problem is also unorganized workers in the, among the natives. So just to focus on the British context, the problem is unorganized British workers as well. And of course, lack of public spending in housing, in health, in education. Now, the irony, if you look at the cause impact of migration, any research you read, um, shows that migration increases productivity in the economy. Migrants are the ones who are taking care of the elderly, which is a big issue in an aging society with a demographic issue. Migrants are covering the care deficit. Migrants are young, so they are actually working, and they're net contributors to social security and the government budget. Um, if you look at the labor market effects, they have positive effects. They complement medium-skilled and high-skilled native workers. Our research does not indicate any obvious negative effects of the migrants on low-skilled workers in the UK uh, either. That's specific to the UK. It may depend on country uh, context, so I don't claim it applies to every country. So, and we have to just debunk one myth. Migrants aren't taking away jobs. They're not a fixed number of jobs. If you like, migrants are contributing to productivity, and in theory, that is to generate more jobs in the economy. So there's not a constant number of jobs that's going to be shared between us. If there is a positive contribution to demand and productivity, businesses invest more, the economy grows more, so more jobs are being created anyway. But actually, when the government is implementing a very uh, radical austerity, cutting spending, obviously migrants' contributions to the budget is not then being channeled to public spending in education, health, or housing. Um, so, and in, in line with the cutting, uh, cutting demand and uh, cutting public spending, unemployment is also increasing. So, of course, people are feeling left behind. I always warn uh, people, two things going together 
their correlation doesn't mean causality. Migration is increasing, inequality is increasing. That doesn't mean migration is causing inequality. So now the irony, um, if migration will be cut, and this is one of the pledges of the government, I don't know how that will work out. Uh, you know, uh, Brexit, how Brexit deal will turn out is anyone's guess. Um, but if they curb migration as they promised to their constituencies, the conservatives in Britain, the government's budget deficit will increase. And of course, this is uh, also a cut in the uh, labor supply who is taking care of the care jobs, a big problem in the aging society. And if we think of the conservative policy, the stance of managing uh, a budget deficit, it's actually likely that the poor people will be losing a lot more from the fall in migration. So that's the irony. Any benefit that uh, low-skilled, poorer people could uh, hope from cuts in migration uh, will be dwarfed by the cuts in public spending further after Brexit. Okay, so what is the real solutions? I'm moving on, trying to move on to a progressive stance. Um, well, particularly now, first I'm going to focus on what can be done in the labor market and with respect to migration. Well, it's about re-regulating the labor market. It's about improving the union legislation to in increase the voice of trade unions and the coverage of collective bargaining. And it's very important uh, to make collective bargaining obligatory and union representation at a workplace obligatory if those firms are to uh, be allowed to hire migrant labor force. So if migrants are a member of the uh, union, there's nothing you can do in terms of undercutting. I'm a union member, I'm a migrant, uh, my wage is negotiated by my uh, union. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of other deregulation uh, instruments, zero hours contracts have to be uh, uh, stopped. There has to be a guaranteed contract with a guaranteed minimum hours of work. Any dodgy self-employment contract in the gig economy has to end. And uh, moreover, in non-standard work, there has to be proper uh, union organization. So there has to be equal rights for people in non-standard work, be it migrant or native. Uh, this is how we manage to avoid undercutting of uh, uh, migrants of, of local workers by migrants. And of course, if we will talk about globalization, then it's about creating a level playing field. So I'm all for regulating labor mobility, but also trade and capital mobility. Let's have trade agreements with labor standards in it, with appropriate protection for workers and the environment. Yes, let's also regulate trade as much as we talk about regulating labor movement. Uh, similarly, uh, if you want to talk about managing uh, labor uh, mobility, I would like you to also start talking about managing foreign direct investment and capital mobility. For example, it has to be consistent with some industrial policy priorities, just like we know from the developmental state experiences of South Korea, for example. Uh, and of course, we need to really think about corporate governance, uh, to have workers as stakeholders. I know um, the Austrian and German model is something the British trade unions are looking up to. And I know it's not all rosy here, but it's very important uh, to have more voice for working people in the corporate governance. And last but not least, it's about increasing the public infrastructure in terms of both the social infrastructure in education, health, childcare, social care, uh, but also housing um, in, in physical infrastructure. And finally, uh, if you're not going to talk about taming uh, finance and international financialization and international financial capital mobility, I don't think it is realistic that we can manage inequality by just managing labor flows. Now, so what type of a Brexit uh, would uh, the progressives uh, hope to get if they were to come to government before this is all over? I kept saying what we had to push for is a deal that would minimize the damage. Uh, Brexit will not be uh, a progressive uh, route. Uh, th th there is no Brexit that will make things better for Britain, in my opinion. So all we can do is to minimize damage. And minimizing damage, believe it or not, in my opinion, means minimizing the distortion to the relationship we have with the rest of Europe. Um, so uh, this would require having some sort of a customs union with Europe and some 
form of uh, full access to the single market. And in my opinion, being part of the existing customs union and European economic area would cut that. Uh, politically, this is not that easy for progressives to, uh, to get that true. Um, I will say, um, uh, I'm, I'm saying it later, but maybe I should say it now. Um, you have to understand that um, two thirds of the Labour Party constituencies, the city's constituencies who voted for the Labour Party, voted by a majority for leaving the European Union. But two thirds of the Labour Party members uh, voted to remain. So the party is having uh, a very difficult situation uh, in that sense, uh, and therefore it's walking a very uh, blurred uh, line. Now, I have several problems, though, still with that position. Um, there's a lot of praise among the progressive left also about single market, uh, but single market is praised only when it comes to accessing markets, goods uh, for markets for goods and services for the exports of the European Union. Freedom of movement uh, of goods and capital is questioned very little by progressives, and little is done on the contrary, to develop a positive narrative for uh, the freedom of movement of labor. The reason why I say EEA would be a good option is because it comes with four freedoms, and I value the fourth freedom, freedom of labor, uh, a lot, and I would like that to come to a par with the mobility of, if you like, uh, capital and goods and services, if anything, improve more. Uh, in the context of a European social model. Um, the progressives are very shy in saying that. There are some progressive negotiation points, nevertheless, uh, and one is about really uh, in a final post-Brexit deal, uh, Labour Party is very eager to remove any uh, restraint on state aid. So this is one of the reasons they think EEA would not be a very good option for uh, a progressive Labour Party government. Um, uh, they surely want to avoid any uh, forced privatization or deregulation clause as part of a regulatory alliance uh, alignment with Europe. Um, and of course, one thing that goes without saying is to make sure that any existing uh, employment rights, human rights, and environmental protection uh, that is underpinned by the existing EU legislation should be preserved uh, in a post-Brexit uh, Britain. Now, where will we go after that? I really will not uh, waste your time by speculating. Um, but obviously, uh, the Labour Party in the Parliament uh, is not committing to uh, a sh an unambiguous uh, yes to a final deal. They do say if it doesn't pass the tests, uh, some of which are related to uh, full access to the single market uh, and workers' rights and environmental protection standards, and a voice for the parliament, they say we may uh, vote it down. So if, of course, the final Brexit deal conservatives negotiate with Europe is voted down in the parliament, that will trigger a general election. What happens then is anyone's guess. There is a campaign going on at the moment led by some trade unions and some Labour Party uh, members about a second people's vote when the final deal is out. Not a rerun of the referendum, but a second vote. And I have to also, however, emphasize that there is also a Lexit position, left exit. An exit from the neoliberal European project is actually the best we can do kind of uh, position, with which I uh, do not agree, but it is an existing position. OK, so uh, within all this, I think Brexit is doing a lot of political damage, much more than the economic effects at the moment or even in the future. And of course, there is a lot of growth in the one nation conservative discourse and a xenophobic right that is coming into the mainstream of the uh, politics. So it's not anymore marginal small parties like UK Independence Party or British Nationalist Party who is doing xenophobic politics. It is the conservative parties, uh, um, several leading figures who are actually very much breeding in this uh, one nation conservative discourse. This is not a very good environment for progressive politics, but we are still doing our best. Um, now, in the uh, last 15 minutes I have, I'm going to talk about um, what I see is the framework of a uh, progressive policy framework should be. And I'll say a few things where the Labour Party is uh, converging to that versus where the Labour Party, in my opinion, is still ha uh, being um, 
a very cautious and timid. So it is to address uh, three goals, in my opinion. This is full employment with decent jobs for both men and women, equality and ecological sustainability. This requires making use of all the tools in our policy uh, toolkit, which requires using a very active fiscal policy with public investment at the core. Labour market policies for an equality-led development, some of which I have already mentioned, industrial policy for steering the economy, and monetary policy uh, as well. With regards to public investment policies, the emphasis should be in smart, innovative investment uh, that tries to tackle both the ecological deficit we have here, the importance uh, is of uh, physical green infrastructure investment in public transport, renewable energy, housing, to address the ecological deficit. We are speaking a lot less about social infrastructure. Um, that is what feminist economists call purple investment in education, childcare, social care, and health, to address the care deficit. Uh, it is something feminists talk a lot because actually human beings don't grow on trees and they're not taken care of on their own. In the absence of a decent public infrastructure, women's unpaid invisible uh, labor is uh, doing that uh, job of addressing the care deficit. Obviously what we want is to have these jobs as proper jobs, well paid, uh, with union representation and voice. Um, so uh, this is, if you like, something we want to call investment in our social fabric. And we also say purple is at the same time green because these are jobs with very low carbon emissions uh, and labor intensive jobs. With one euro, you can create a lot more jobs so you can manage with lower growth and lower carbon emissions, hence it is green. Now, we of course are always asked if you're talking about policy proposals, Who's going to finance it? All that sounds great, but how can we do it? Well, we know how to do that. Uh, the bread and butter of financing, of course, uh, public spending is about a progressive taxation policy of not just income, but also wealth. But the second tool, borrowing, is a taboo, of course, in Europe. It's a taboo in Britain, too. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that because it's a big discussion point at, uh, at the moment at the Labour Party. The third way to finance such uh, spending is to mobilize a national development bank, a national investment bank, and the European corollary to that is the European investment bank becoming more uh, vocal and active. And the fourth is to use monetary policy in a smarter way than we currently do with our quantitative easing. Okay, borrowing here is the most controversial policy. Uh, Labour Party was very timid in the sense that Conservatives always attack progressives, and in particular Labour Party in the British context. You come to power, you spend, you're irresponsible, you're going to leave public debt to the future generations. And this is a big torpedo to household budgets. So Labour Party tried to overcome this uh, mainstream uh, discourse by introducing what they call a fiscal credibility rule. Golden rule uh, is sometimes how it is known. Um, so the idea here is this. We will borrow in a very limited way only for investing in public infrastructure. Okay, th that sounds quite good. Uh, why is that uh, legitimate? Because economists, macro Keynesian economists would anyway say, okay, uh, if you invest in public infrastructure, this will anyway generate some demand in the economy, even in the short run through multiplier effects. It will partly self-finance. So there is money um, because of that multiplier mechanism. And of course, if you're investing in infrastructure, it will in the long run also create more income because it will increase productivity in the long run. So overall, it will lead to more tax revenues both in the short and the long run. Now, I don't disagree with that. Uh, my question is the following. Um, what is infrastructure? Now, at the moment, Labour Party is very timid in defining infrastructure as how it is conventionally described. This is only infrastructure in terms of physical infrastructure in roads, rails, energy, housing. Feminist economists, Women's Budget Group in the UK in particular, is saying, has been writing and uh, uh, advocating year after year, let's define social spending in 
care economy in child care, social care, health care and education also as infrastructure. Let's call it investment. Now, it may come trivial to people who are not economists, but in economics and in our standard national accounts and statistics, believe me, if I pay to a care worker, a nursery teacher, a nurse, a doctor, or a teacher or a lecturer, this is current spending in our national accounts. It's spending, it's not investment. In a way, we are investing in our um, human capital in our children uh, or in our uh, younger generations who will be very soon the productive uh, labor force of our economy, but we don't call it investment in our national statistics. And Labor Party is very worried that if they call it investment, they will look like this is fiddling numbers, so they stop shy of that. Um, okay, so uh, obviously if genuinely we would value what matters to our economy and social fabric and call social infrastructure investment, we could revise our fiscal credibility rule and say, let's borrow to invest in not just physical infrastructure, but also in social public infrastructure. So this is one of the debates at the moment. There is room for extending that debate. I've been asked to write a chapter exactly on that by John McDonald, the current shadow chancellor. He's editing a book. So uh, at least there is openness, but there is a lot of taboo at the doorstep when you're com campaigning with people. Okay. I'll say a few words about some of the, uh, one of the other interesting flagship policies of the Labour Party. That's uh, a national investment bank. Uh, again, the idea isn't uh, very radical, but for Britain it is very radical. And we presented, we wrote a report and presented that at the City of London uh, last month. Uh, and actually, um, even the city is understanding that this is something that will stabilize the economy. The idea is actually really extending the the cafe type of uh, German uh, development bank model. So it's an own lending strategy, uh, but the National Investment Bank is initially financed by the government, by an initial equity financing, and um, this would mean that in the first year of the, a new Labour government, if there is a Labour government, uh, the bank would get about 20 billion uh, uh, pounds uh, from the government, so it will issue, uh, if you like, equity, and the government will buy that. This is, of course, uh, some spending, and it's about 1% of the existing public debt, so not a major thing. And then the national bank would be able to use that equity basis to borrow in the financial markets, and to extend long-term uh, lending. The idea is within 10 years, it is going to be able to create about 20, 250 billion long-term uh, uh, lending to a variety of uh, firms in a variety of targeted sectors consistent with an industrial policy that includes not just small and medium enterprises, but also cooperatives. That's another flagship Labour Party policy to increase the size of the cooperatives in the economy. Uh, and of course, the idea is that it will also crowd in private investment and it will address regional inequalities. Uh, and this is not a substitute for public spending. As I said, there is a lot of eagerness to spend for uh, at least physical infrastructure and to increase taxation to spend for social spending as well, though borrowing there is uh, the gap. Now. Um, Okay, uh, in terms of uh, monetary policy, I'll come back to the National Investment Bank and where, uh, where we find some gaps there. But let me first talk about monetary policy. Obviously, this is the same problem with ECB as well. Um, now, how can we go beyond the existing monetary policy idea that is too focused on inflation and somewhat on financial stability? The Labour Party recently has floated the idea that we will make the central bank, Bank of England, also target productivity. I would have rather heard there something targeting full employment with decent jobs. Um, but the most important problem, in my opinion, is that the independence of the central bank or the Bank of England is still very much uh, a taboo. Um, an alternative monetary policy could outright ask the Bank of England or the European Central Bank, to buy bonds from the National Investment Bank in the British context or the European Investment Bank uh, in the Eurozone context. So basically to extend the quantitative easing to what you could call a version of a people's quantitative easing, to make use of uh, central banks' money creation power 
to finance investment via a national development bank or outright buying government bonds to finance some targeted public investment. Obviously, this is very much a uh, taboo area at the moment, uh, even uh, in a progressive environment like the Labour Party currently. Um, okay, I, I'm just going to ask you questions about the remit of our central banks, be it Bank of England or the European Central Bank. Should it be independent from the Parliament, or rather, should we want it to be independent from the financial interests, vested interests, and financial markets? Uh, I am for independence, but independence from whom is the question I want to ask here. And of course, um, I would rather have a central bank that is accountable to deliver policy targets consistent with uh, an election manifesto that the people voted uh, to come to power. Uh, I had a few things to, to debunk about the myths around this budget surplus ideology, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. And we have crunched some numbers for a recent project for the Foundation of European Progressive Studies, how a mix of public investment, adequate labor market policies to increase wage share and a progressive policy, uh, uh, progressive taxation policy would create in Europe about 6% higher GDP, more private investment, uh, more balanced budgets with very modest inflation rates. But I'm not going to talk about the details of this. So to sum up, uh, before I say a few words what it means for an alternative Europe, if you want recovery, and sustainability, both socially and uh, politically and ecologically, they would need uh, green and purple public spending and public jobs for women and men with a pay rise, again, for uh, both men and women. And of course, thinking of shorter hours, about which I have said uh, nothing at the moment. And since we are all very obsessed in Europe and Britain about the budget deficits, I'll just rephrase Keynes here. If you take care of full employment, Keynes said, budget will take care of itself. I'm adding to that in the 21st century, if you take care of full employment, decent pay for women and men, equality and ecological sustainability, budget is actually balancing itself. That shouldn't be the priority, that's the outcome of good policy making. And I said uh, I'm one of uh, those in Britain who would continue to uh, work with Europeans for another Europe, which hopefully one day will be appealing to the British people as well to uh, vote for another uh, referendum to join a different transformed Europe. So what would that transformed Europe would look like? And I think if we don't do that, Britain may not be the first one to leave. So that's actually very important. We need to get our act together in terms of fiscal policy, coordinated taxation policy. Europe is a chance to co coordinate policy. So let's use that uh, in terms of closing tax loopholes, of course. Some of the work I was doing for the Syriza government in 2015, including talking about public debt audit and restructuring, but coordinated at the EU level, calling for a European debt conference. Um, this has nothing to do with the current uh, uh, restructuring of the Greek debt. That is not worthy of the word restructuring, but we may discuss that in uh, the discussion, if you like. I told, uh, talked a little bit about monetary policy. It's, uh, as I said, it applies to European Central Bank as well. We need to turn European Central Bank to a genuine central bank, a genuine lender of last resort, but also make it accountable to the European Parliament targeting the policy uh, targets for regional convergence, social convergence of the European um, uh, policies. And of course, we're not going to be able to do that if we don't take finance under uh, control. Part of that is having speed bumps. Of course, in Vienna, attack was always very outspoken and effective about pushing for a financial transaction tax. Uh, we need to talk about seriously how to regulate the shadow banking. But most of all, we need to think of growing our own. Uh, not in the Schrebe Garden type of growing our own, but growing a not-for-profit financial sector that is large enough to uh, meet the uh, uh, borrowing needs uh, and saving needs of people in the form of cooperative banks, but also in terms of financing large projects. Um, if we don't want to have too many large banks too big to fail, they take on excessive risk, we need a large bank of our own. 
We have one, European Investment Bank. It needs a new uh, remit such that we can spread investment across Europe. Uh, and of course, we need to think about democratic control. It's not just good enough to have um, state-owned entities. Uh, how do we control these? How do we participate in decision making? And we need to seriously talk about our European welfare state. We can't have the euro without uh, a political union and without a European social welfare state. That requires having a substantially larger European Union budget financed by progressive European Union taxes, as well as pooling some risk in the form of euro bonds. And of course, a welfare state doesn't uh, exist without a decent pay-as-you-go type pension system and without a decent unemployment benefit system, which must be also having some European nature to redistribute from low to high unemployment regions. And last but not least, we have to talk about a European minimum wage, not just like one single European wage, of course, we had to use that as a tool for convergence. One idea uh, by Schulten and what was to have a minimum wage as a ratio to, for example, 60% of the median wage, the middle wage in each country, hence a different minimum wage. And as we converge living standards, of course, minimum wages will converge too. And we have been writing a lot about also the need for wage coordination, not just uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy coordination, but also policies to avoid bigger than neighbor wage policies that, of course, requires redefining social partnership at the European level. It requires having European Union, uh, trade unions having more voice at the EU level. Um, and it requires seriously having talk about productivity-oriented wage policies and wage policies accounting current account positions, not only in the deficit countries, but also in the surplus countries like Germany, um, such that we can ensure living standards grow and uh, we also uh, manage excessive inflation. There's a lot that we have written uh, around that. Most of it is published, but it's also freely available at our website. Uh, so I'll leave the slides. And I look forward to your points, really. I'm very happy uh, until, until I have to take a flight to catch a speech that I have to make uh, tomorrow in the morning in London. I'm very happy to stay for uh, discussion here today. Thank you very much.